Hello, welcome to uh, episode 51 of the Nutcast. It is Thursday the 28th of January and today I'm going to be talking about um, what some of you will probably find quite controversial is about U2's All That You Can't Leave Behind album from the year 2000. Now there's a number of other things I'm going to be talking about but the first and probably most important thing you're going to be asking is where has the beard gone? Well I'm glad you asked that, not that you asked that because I'm talking to my phone and I don't actually hear what people are saying in the background is I had a spot in my beard which is a shocking state of affairs. I'm too old to get spots but I got one in my beard and when I removed a tiny bit of the beard to see how that spot could be removed uh, I suddenly realized I looked ridiculous and I had to take the whole thing off so that's how it goes um, and so be it so today I'm uh, going to start off with you two all that you can't leave behind but also kind of like a little bit of a, a legacy from what happened previously so it might be a quite a long episode I might break it into two parts I have no idea um, I, I just won't know until I get there or probably when I start to think hmm been talking for an awful lot of time about this one thing maybe i should break it up into two parts um so 1998 the band ended their pop mart tour on the 21st of march in johannesburg johannesburg not johannesburg and um that show was on television and just before the end of the pop mart tour uh, the penultimate show uh, was was filmed at Cape Town and parts of it are released on Entropy which I mentioned in a previous episode I said I couldn't find the DVD then it was true if I told you that now it would be a lie because what I found is I'd stuck it in my regular movie pile and not in my pile of weird stuff that I don't care about too much when it comes to filing CDs DVDs LPs and things like that I think everyone's got a pile of just random crap that they kind of stick in the corner and forget about I thought Entropy was in there it wasn't. It was in, in my pile of regular things, under E, in between, mm, something starting with E-M and something starting with E-R, probably. I don't know. Anyway, so in 1999, or late 1998, uh, the first post-Pop Mart thing came out, which was which was this, which was a, a film directed by Phil Joanu, who had directed Rattle and Hum. It's about a filmmaker who started off making films about music and then start and then went into making uh, less successful movies um, one of which was was this uh, which is very autobiographical it features a talking cat uh, it features appearances by Bono and Larry and it features a lot probably about six or seven minutes of filmed footage from the Cape Town show in 1998 and by the way Pop Mart has never looked so good so this isn't the, the VHS kind of level or the, the, the high quality video level which you'll have seen on the Pop Mart in Mexico DVD uh, this is proper movie camera level uh, footage it's excellent there's about six minutes of it in the film there should be a heck of a lot more of it in the film than there is uh, when somebody comes to unearthing the huge huge world of the youtube archive and uh, should they ever need a something to stick in the pop mark box set uh, then please put the, the cape town show uh, which was filmed for this because it looks phenomenal uh, pop mark has never looked so good and i've seen a lot of pop mark shows so anyway entropy now entropy i think feels really like it was the the last gasp of weird youtube actually uh, bono plays a rock star called bono who talks to phil drynu who's played by stephen dorf uh, through the medium of turning up in person uh, having telekinetic powers and being able to lock him in a hotel room and also talking to him directly through the television it's all a little bit weird and a little bit lovely uh, and it's a really strange film um, and uh, it needs a proper that, that footage really needs a proper release but that largely disappeared. I think it played on some art, art house festivals. And I think it appeared on Sky TV. Uh, this version on DVD in the UK, somewhat bizarrely, is released by Sky DVD. Uh, and it's a 4.3 um, in the days when people had televisions that were square and not rectangular. Um, so that, that really brings the Pop Mart era shuddering to a close. And around about the same time, um, as I've mentioned in a previous episode, uh, late 1998 saw the release of the best of 1980 
1990, which as I've kind of alluded to, I think was a, you know, a contractual obligation, uh, but also I think the band saw it really as a bit of a course correction after Park Mart. Uh, it was kind of like a way of saying, hey guys, remember us? We're the guys with the hats and the helmets and the really sincere songs about, you know, where streets don't have road signs and uh, where you, you still can't find what you're looking for and all that type of stuff. Um, and it was a, it was a, it was trying to sh to remind everybody that although it was a long, long way from from chopping down the Joshua Tree to this, uh, it's a long way from the Pop Mart to the Joshua Tree, um, that it was still the same band. It was it was a course correction. It was a reminder. I think it did its job because it reminded people that the old lovely U2 that was very sincere and dressed largely in black and white. Uh, still existed uh, and it was almost a way of you know going back to the basics and saying right so you followed us through the 90s you followed us through the path that we've got through through pop mart we've gone down that avenue that's a bit weird uh, so there's a law of diminishing returns down that avenue we're not going to go down there anymore it's almost like you've gone one junction too far on the pop motorway and you've actually decided to come back and start again from a different angle and go now we're going to carry on down this route we're going to go to pop nirvana instead of going to go to pop zero uh it was a good album and as i've mentioned before it's a uh, chock full of b-sides the two cd version of it um and, and well worth getting and um, but what it was actually it kind of also reset U2 because U2 are one of the very few bands that that really see it as being very very important that they will they want everybody who likes them to like them. U2 will not go weird, and when they went weird, they were still trying to be very accessible. Um, you know, they're they're not a band that wants to live in a small world. They want everybody to like them, everybody to listen to them. Uh, and I think there's there's egotism in that. You know, if you're in a band, if you're devoting your creative life to making music. You want as many people as possible to enjoy that music, and you want as many people as possible to have the same feeling that you do. Well, when you're, you're in a band and, and you're, you know, I remember when when I was in a band and I um, we were playing songs that nobody had heard, and I saw people singing in the crowd along to the songs, and I was like, that's pretty good. That that's good for your ego. Uh, and if people like that, then. I wanted everybody to like that in the same way that when I go and see bands and I, I you jollies about bands and I go, this band are amazing. I want people to feel the same things I feel about the band and I want all the bands I like to be absolutely enormous and you two clearly wanted to be absolutely enormous too because they wanted people to like them because they thought they were really, really good at what they're going to do. So that to one hand, the best of, put that to one side. Um, the band then kind of carried on now there's a, a release which i file um around about this period which is the best of 90 to 2000 but i think we're going to have to come back to that later um but what it serves is the band came to the end of 1999 and uh, they ended 1999 with this terrible single uh, by wycliffe sheen john uh, bono i think i've listened to it once i didn't like it i've never felt the need to go back to it there was also this, the remixes of New Year's Day by Music and U2, is just like instrumental dance mixes of New Year's Day. Uh, it's not particularly good. So the band started off early 2000 uh, with this, the Million Dollar Hotel soundtrack, which is uh, probably not, not a U2 album, but it's a U2 adjacent album. And if you're going deep into U2's career, this is a record that, or a CD, because it's not been issued on vinyl, I think. This is a CD that you should own. And now it's got two songs by U2 on it. So one is The Ground Beneath Her Feet and the other one is Stateless. And it's got a, a number of other songs which are very, very close to being U2. So, for example, there's Falling At Your Feet by Bono and Daniel Lenoir. Uh, there's a, a re-recorded version of Satellite of Love, which has vocals by Mila Jonovic. Um, she can't sing for Toffee on this version, by the way. Uh, and there's Danny Sabre remix, which has an exclusive Bono vocal on. Of that light of love on here, which is really really good, um, but uh, also there's a, a number of other solo songs that are performed by Bono. Uh, also, the last track on it is Anarchy in the UK, uh, which is Adam, Larry, and Bono alongside a singer called Tito Lariva performing at Anarchy in the UK, UK, but with lyrics around Anarchy in the USA and sung in Spanish. Uh, it is as about as essential as it sounds. This album is a rich man's folly. It's, it's the least essential of the albums which you two have invested a huge amount of time in, I think. They spent a couple of months working on it. 
uh, and I think Edge was largely working on all that you can't leave behind. So most of it is Adam, Larry, and Bono. Um, it's a soundtrack album. It's not as good as Passengers. It's the very last gasp of the utterly weird U2. Um, and almost every member of U2 plays on almost every song. Uh, the soundtrack album was badly sequenced. Um, it, it shows a side of U2 that you hardly ever get to see. In The Ground Beneath the Feet and Stateless, there's a, there's a very quiet, ambient, almost Twin Peaks style, vaguely threatening late night air. Uh, where I'd love to hear an album of songs like that, which is you two whispering in your ear just as you're about to go to sleep, as opposed to shouting from the rooftops, trying to create a revolution with a guitar. Um, and it's... <sighs> uh, it's it, this album is not where I was when it came out. Absolutely not where I was. I was not interested in this album at all. And by the time this, this, this came out, you know, my life was very different. This was not the stuff I wanted to hear from you too. And, of course, um, conversely, I will pick up upon the, the next kind of thing that really hit, which was in late 2000, uh, U2 released a song you have probably heard of, Beautiful Day. Uh, and Beautiful Day and its subsequent album, All That You Can't Leave Behind, is absolutely not where I was when it came out. So I felt for the first time that U2 were going in a different direction than I was. I know a lot of people absolutely love this album, All That You Can't Leave Behind. Um, I really, really wish I did. I don't. Uh, and this is where I'm going to get to, I'm afraid to say, get my knives out around this. So All That You Can't Leave Behind is probably, out of the 15 records that I regard as U2 albums, it's in the bottom three. Um, it's above Rattle and Hum. It's above October. It's not above everything else. Uh, and I'm going to kind of explain... Why? Because where I was at the time that this album came out is absolutely not where this album was. So this album was you know, very clearly around the art of, of songwriting, around the band almost course correcting what they'd done in the 90s, building upon that and then adding back into it, now that they'd, they'd fully explored and done to the nth degree the element of weird, coming back and doing stuff that was far more direct, far more sincere uh, and far more on the nose. Now, as is always the case, in every episode when I talk about U2, I will get quotes from this book, which is U2 by U2. And talking about all that you can't leave behind, um, I'm just going to quickly read out from here. Imagine that, if you will, that this is like a more tolerable version of Morrissey by Morrissey, where Morrissey's autobiography is read out by the actor David Morrissey. Um, he said, we bought ourselves a bit of time by doing the best of, and we'd always resisted doing anything that looked like that, because uh, uh, whereas if we isolated it to the first 10 years, it looked a bit more like housekeeping. Um, and Adam said, we were a bit bruised and bloody after the pop experience. And even though the audience and sales figures were in the millions, it didn't catch far the way that we hoped it would. We got the feeling that we hadn't quite dotted the I's and crossed the T's. Um, and I think really, you know, that's that's the band saying, well, we, we got it. it. It didn't land correctly. Um, and, you know, but it, it was just not a great period for them. And they had to go back. And, and, and rebuild themselves really and recast themselves as, as you too um now all that you can't leave behind is as edge says on page 367 of this paperback uh, it was the first album that acknowledged their past which they'd never done before um and as larry said people thought it was a return to the u2 of old and they were still using the studio in the same way so it wasn't the end of the drum machine and it's quite right you know because technology is a huge part of all that you can't leave behind it's just not so obvious and you know the band aren't quite so uh, enthralled to technology so it, it, it feels like it's painting with a smaller set of colors it's using a slightly broader brush um, they're still moving on from where they were but all that you can't leave behind i mean even if you look at the cover of, of pop that big day glow oranges yellows silvers it's all gone to black and white for all that you can't leave behind um, uh, and it, it's clearly the sounds of the band trying to focus on exactly what they regarded as essential and that's even built into the title all that you can't leave behind it is really back to basics you know putting everything that's really really important to the band and putting it in one place and, and really refining and focusing it almost as if you've got you know one shot as Eminem said in uh, Lose Yourself and you know you, you, it's the band focusing on all of that and going we're going to do that 
nothing else that we're going to fall short on what we're best of. And as I've said before, you two always wanted to be big, they always wanted to be very accessible. Um, and this is an album that really, really was designed to make sure and restate that the band, you know, were successful and successful in an artistic and commercial and creative sense. So I think the way the band have always seen their work is the more people that it resonates with, the more successful it is as an art, because there's an element of, of not being indulgent when you create art. You've got to remember that as soon as that sound leaves that speaker, it has to go somewhere. It has to land with someone and someone has to listen to it, hear it, understand it and comprehend it. So it's not just made for completely selfish purposes. You know, art to me, for example, is a map to how I see the universe and a map to the unknown and music helps me understand the world that I live in and it helps shine a light and a torch on areas and ways of thinking and ways of seeing the world that I hadn't seen before and I think you two really wanted to do that and that is reflected in the quote that's on the cover so if you look here this so uh, this gate number here is J3333 which stands for a, a section from the bible Jeremiah 333 which is uh, something along the lines of and I've written it down but I can't remember where I've put it at the moment is something like call unto me and I will answer uh, great and mighty things which you have not yet seen or something along those lines so it's you know it's a, it's a reference to the to, to the bible around the ethics and ideas that you've got and, and you can also boil it down to all that you can't leave behind is what is important to you and i think the thing that's most important to all of us is who we are and our own identities and we can't change who we are and that is what we have to take with us in the rest of our lives through everything that we absolutely do and that's why you've got the logo here of the heart in the suitcase you know your heart the thing that you believe that's the thing that you take with you through everything in the rest of your life um, you can't change that those are your ethics those are your beliefs those are your principles that's that's a core part of your identity and um, you know all, all the lyrics on the album a great many of them refer to that as like you know you're packing a suitcase for a place that you've never been before you're putting all of your ethics and your arts into you know a, a package and you're taking that package forward now visually the uh, the uh, the period around all that you can't leave behind, by the way, is absolutely fantastic and fascinating. And uh, if I can remember where I've put the book, uh, this one here, Stealing Hearts at a Travelling Show, which I've mentioned many, many times before and will continue to mention. And pretty much every one of these, as we go along, has alternate sleeves and, and artwork that's designed for the band. And Steve Averill, who was uh, you know, the band's designer, um, decided that what he wanted to do is he wanted to pick up the iconography um, that the band had and used something that was went you know beyond language so they created a um, a series of, of I think what's it called isotypes which is a you know a graphic themes which survive language so for example if you look at road signs in other countries you can see that it's a road sign like for example the the sign of the cross um, that's flashing green that's the international language of the pharmacy uh, and for the for the album uh, what the uh, and, and and the art that went with it. I think what the band tried to do is they tried to create you know a series of, of symbols and images that transcended language into core ideas. That no matter what language you were you were speaking in, what language you spoke, how you understood it, you clearly understood. You know that that kind of iconography there, for example. Sure, that's the international sign for a toilet at an airport, but also it's around, you know, men, women, and, and each one of the, the, the band's works around this period kind of dove deeply into a, a, a language that was visual and that fully transcended uh, words. So, uh, you know, you look at the alternate covers that you've got for the album, uh, and there's lots of different working titles that the album has here. So, for example, one of it was 40, which was based upon Psalm 40, but also upon the name of the last track on War, which also tied in with the ages that the band were hitting at about the time this came out. Uh, there was also At Heart Zero, um, Sumer, which is next to the sea. And, of course, one of my, my favourite images here, Grand Canal Docks, which was rejected on the grounds that um, that could be easily uh, re reconfigured uh, to use a combination of body parts is probably the nicest and best way to do it. So the, the series of pictograms, um, and that is what they were, that were on the album, um, as, as Steve Avril says, um, were designed to be in a limited palette, but also to create almost an alternate kind of like 
travel agency or something along those lines. So people see that they were moving and translating themselves. So for example, the three symbols that you've got on the t-shirt here, you've got the heart in the suitcase, you've got an apple, and you've got what looks to be a bird with a leaf in its mouth. And, and the three symbols on the U2 t-shirts, by the way, are symbols that have been used over many, many years. So here's the Popmart t-shirt, for example, which you would have seen from a previous episode, which has the earth a shopping trolley and a record player and subsequent tours for example you'll have vertigo uh, which again here has the three symbols and pictograms which has the v the peace sign and a bomb to go alongside the how to dismantle an atomic bomb album and this one here is a tour shirt for 360 which again features a spaceship uh, the symbol from no line on the horizon which is the top and bottom of the horizon and then that that symbol there which is the, the 360 vision of vision over visibility so at the point and by the way if the band still did those three symbols t-shirts i guarantee that they would sell lots and lots of them at shows because there are lots of people like me who buy the three symbols t-shirts on the tours and we want to have the complete set and the fact that they didn't do the complete set on the 2015 2017 or 2018 touring rounds was a mild disappointment but as anybody who knows me knows i have far too many band t-shirts so it's kind of a double-edged sword at the same time so moving on from the iconography of the album all that you can't leave behind and the use of pictograms and isotypes to create a universal language what the band are trying to do with the whole of this record and it's symbolized in the name of the album is to create something that's absolutely core and essential and go, this is what we really believe this is who we really are um and you know it starts off with beautiful day which is a you know the sign of a band that was wiping out the previous decade they were saying you know all of that layering all of that use of the medium all of the insincere stuff all of the artifice all of the wrapping all of the armor we're going to take all of that away and we're just going to present four people presented in black and white no uniforms no outfits no cowboy hats nothing like that just the people who are going to directly communicate to you as you two going this is what we really believe. And for most bands will say, oh yeah, you know, our latest albums, our best album, it's Back to Basics. This is this is U2, Back to Basics, really stripping away everything else and wearing their hearts quite literally on their sleeves. And it's, you know, I don't like this album. I, I respect it. There are a lot of great songs on this, but I don't think it's anywhere near U2's best work. Primarily because I like the weird shit. And um, what, I, what I liked and what I really loved about the 90s, which is my favourite period of the band, is the fact that they were playful and they were messing around with the medium and they were messing around with the artifice. And this feels very much like an Oliver Stone movie, uh, except using guitars instead of cinema. Um, and, you know, it, it's all, it's, it's like on the 90s, the band had gone so far they'd almost lost their way back home. Um, that they'd, they'd gone out there to see and to touch and to taste too much before they finally could return. And this is them on their return, coming back. Like, we've been out there, we've been in the wars, we've seen all the weird stuff, we've come back. This is what matters. We are the, the pilgrims from the 40 days in the rock wilderness out there, lost in the pop mart and, and lost in Europa. We've come back and this is what we really, really believe. But this was not where I was at the time that this album came out. Um, and... Uh, I'm going to explain why the album didn't hit me the way that I wanted it to hit me at the time it came out. And by the way, every time a band that I love releases an album, I want to be blown away. I want my ears to be pinned back like the stupid skeleton in the re-record, not fade away 90s advert. Just going, oh my God, this band are fucking amazing, man. They've blown my mind yet again. I want that with every record that comes out, every film that I watch, every book that I read. I want to be blown away by how amazing it is. Um, but I also go in with no expectations because I know that not every time you're not going to put the ball through the hoop every time. You're not going to hit the target every time. When you aim for the moon, inevitably, sometimes you will not hit it. But God damn it, it's better to try and to fail than not to try at all. And with this album, where I was at the time this album came out was absolutely not where this album was. So in the year 2000, when this album came out, I, I was not in a great place. Um, I, I just had you know six months before this album came out i'd had a terrible breakup with somebody um where i felt that i'd been discarded like a used crisp wrapper um and what i wanted was was an album that reflected that uh, as opposed to an album that was full of joy and hope because i was not full of joy and hope i was going through a really tough time 
Um, I, w I was living in a, a, a flat in Walsall um, and it, it had no central heating. And I didn't have very much money at all, to put it nicely. Um, and, you know, the, the person that I thought I was going to share my future with had a very different idea. And so the idea around certainty and the idea around planning for the future had been thrown away in that year. And I had to rethink completely what life was. So, you know, when we think about the narrative that we have in our lives and as we go through our lives and everybody thinks, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to get a dog, I'm going to get 2.4 children, I'm going to get a Ford Mondeo. You know, I thought I'd had that future planned and mapped out and, and somebody had taken all of that, you know, all my dreams and my hopes and they'd thrown them in the bin because what I was offering them was not what they wanted. Uh, and what you two were offering was not really what I wanted at the time. I wanted a record that really, you know, reflected that experience uh, and also gave me, you know, a a divining rod that would lead towards the future. So this album didn't really work for me. Over time, I've grown to like it a lot, lot more. But still, what I regard to be the 13th best U2 album is still a heck of a lot better than the entire sum of most bands' careers. Um, and it was a simple, direct album. It, it was, you know, sonically, it was nowhere near as diverse as the other records. It almost was second guessing what you two thought a lapsed U2 fan would want to hear. If you hadn't heard U2 for 10 years or you'd been put off by the weird stuff, what would you want the album to sound like? And the answer would be very similar to this, I think. Um, and, you know, it, it was a record that I think was designed for an average U2 fan, and I don't mean that in a critical way, but nobody likes to think of themselves as being average. I don't think I'm average. I, I'm bloody brilliant at being me. I'm terrible at being anybody else. Um, I don't think anybody wants to think of themselves as average. Everyone wants to think of themselves as unique. Um, and this album didn't really hit the way that I wanted it to hit. It felt like you 2 were second-guessing and they weren't being sincere in what they were playing. They were kind of thinking, well, that will go down quite well with the fans. Uh, and it almost felt like a checklist of some of the things that you would expect you 2 to have. So big imagery, big guitars... You know, a few stadium anthems, a sad song in the middle, that type of stuff. It felt a little cynical and a little calculated, but at the same time, utterly sincere. It was the band were accentuating a part of their personality and their identity. Um, and, and these were the results that, that, that came out of it. Um, for the first time in their career, the band avoided a deadline. As I mentioned in the previous episode, they really got bitten by pop by having a tour scheduled and a release date scheduled before the album was ready. This time round, the band went for the album, they finished the album, and then they decided what they were going to do next around it. Um, but it, it was a bit cynical. You know, the band started paid a promotional tour for the first time in a long time, which was a small number of relatively short shows, high profile TV appearances, radio sessions and things like that to remind people we're still you too. And to get onto the radio as opposed to thinking about selling the album just in the context of, of live shows. Um, and as I've said before, you know, this wasn't where I was at the time. Now, for you two, art is around successful communication. And the more people that like it and the more successful it is, the more successful their artistic um, and creative endeavours are. Art takes me to places I can't go on my own. You know, art is like a springboard for my imagination. Um, and, well, you two, I think, always felt that the less people that you reach, the less successful you are in communicating your message. Uh, but it, it was too obvious. And I think I'm going to have to be really blunt about it. Big Black used to sequence their albums in the order of, of the songs by the order of goodness. I've mentioned it before. First song, amazing. Last song, worst song on the album. And it feels like this is how they sequenced all that you can't leave behind. The first five songs on this record which are beautiful day stuck in a moment you can't get out of elevation walk on and kite are great superior u2 songs no no ifs no buts i'm not going to pretend that they are they're great songs but then what we start to do side two is the worst side of any single u2 album the first song on side two is wild honey wild honey is probably the second worst song that u2 have ever put on an album it's they don't like it, you know, uh, in, in the U2 by U2 book, which again I will mention. Um, you know, the, the bands are, are quite clear about Wild Honey. 
um, they don't like it. Uh, and I think Larry says, where is it? He says, Larry says, it's a playful side to you two. You rarely get to see it. It wasn't one of my favourites. Uh, Edge says, it may have been a misjudgment. Adam said, it, there was a lot of debate about whether or not that would be included. Um, and um, Bono says, I really did want it on the album because it was playful and it broke the mood. But Wild Honey is a crap song for you too. It's um, lacking in depth. It's bubblegum, you know, and, and, and it, the lyrics are amazing. Um, the, the melody is, is basic. It's very much obli dee, obli da. It tries to be as good as the Beatles, but it's like you two covering an unreleased Beatles song, but it's the worst Beatles song that you've ever heard. And the worst Beatles song you've ever heard by a very, very long way. It's not a tenth as good as an average Beatles song or an average U2 song. It's shit, and I don't know why it's on the album, and I'm very glad that they don't play it live. And then the rest of the album tails off with unfor unforgiv unforgivably bad songs. Uh, Peace on Earth uh, is okay. When I look at the world is really obvious and it's lyrically anodyne um grace is okay but new york i hate new york as well like i hate most u2 songs named after american cities um new york is a song about how you can easily afford to get a bachelor pad in the, one of the most expensive cities in the world and it's got lyrics about steam and carts and taxis and unless you've been to new york the song's meaningless. I listen to it and I go, okay, mate, you're telling me that you're very rich, you can afford to keep a bachelor pad in New York, and you don't have to worry about the things that everyone else has to worry about. So that was one of the first out songs on a U2 album where you think, okay, so you've untangled yourself from things like money, jobs. You know, you've conquered Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You've gone beyond things like Am I going to be able to afford enough food? Have I got a job that's going to pay me? You know, you, you're starting to, th to, to to do navel gazing about nothingness. And New York is one of the worst U2 songs as well. I don't like it. I've never liked it. And the reason I never liked it is because I think the lyrics are terrible. Now, after 9-11, the lyrics to New York became appropriated and changed their meaning. But at the time, and I lived for a year with this album before 9-11, and that song never got any better. When I saw them at Manchester on the Elevation Tour, I was bored during that song because it's a song about rich people and rich houses. And um, as Brian Ferry said, and one of the reasons Brian Ferry doesn't release that many studio albums of original material is how many songs about swimming pools and dating supermodels can I write? You know, And this is, it was verging on the edge of that. I don't like New York by you two and i don't like huge chunks of this album because i think the first five songs are fantastic and the last six songs fall off not no not only do they retreat from from the cliff edge of greatness they fall off it to a dramatic edge and um, there just aren't enough songs to make this album a great album there's four or five great songs on it but there's six not very good songs on it and when you've got six not very good songs and four or five great songs what you end up with is an album of singles and if your album is full of singles if it is michael jackson's thriller if it's def leopard's uh, hysteria great quids in you've got a great album but if you've got four good singles and some really bad songs you know you end up with an album that isn't that good and that is what all that you can't leave behind is it's not that good an album and i don't like kicking it I, you know i wanted to be taken away and, and there's you know that wonderful line in beautiful day uh where, where bono sings you know touch me take me to the other place uh, and that is yeah that is art in in the, the entire of, of my way of looking at art in one line is that's it I want this song to steal me, to transport me, to take me to somewhere else, to go to a place that I have never been, to you know, teleport me away into a different universe. Uh, and, and the album just, just didn't do it for me, I'm afraid to say. Um, and it's it's just not that great a record. you know. And then the band came out and did started doing touring. Uh, this is the UK version of the album, which has got the ground beneath her feet on, uh, by the way. And, and the album start, uh, and the band started touring. They started playing promotional radio shows. Here's a bootleg CD of New York's Irving Plaza, uh, which is brilliant, actually. It's great. It's four guys making a racket on a stage. And I've seen you two play. It's just four guys on a stage. No, no show, no lights, nothing. They're really, really good at it. Um, but after Pop Mart, you then have to think, well, how is that going to translate? 
You know, now if you see you two in a small room, if if hell, if any of us ever see you two again, but if you see you two in a small room, and, and the one thing I saw when I, uh, I saw them play the Tier Five Friday show to about four hundred people, is as four people making a racket, they're really bloody good at it. They're really good at it. Um, you know, they don't need the lights and the cameras and the video and the sounds and the technicians and all that stuff is nice to have, but it's not what they need. But they're but they're just great at making a racket, and that's exactly what this was doing and it's exactly what the, the subsequent elevation tour as well did um so before we get to the elevation tour february saw the release i think this is a walk on from canada uh, which is backed with a couple of, of uh, extra songs one is big girls are best which i think was recorded at a soundtrack during the pop era this is stuck in a moment that you you can't get out of and, it, and that is the song that most sounds like something from the 80s, actually. It sounds like Angel of Harlem, When Love Comes to Town. It's it's a very direct, very straight, very plaintive song um, about, you know, people. And we've all, we've all known people that have got themselves into situations that they can't get out of. And sometimes you're just bloody glad that you're not that person at the time. And then the band moved into the uh, the Elevation Tour. And the Elevation Tour, uh, which was on... Uh, this DVD um, was a great show, by the way. I'm not going to pretend for a second that it wasn't. It was a brilliant show, but it didn't please everybody. And, and I'm going to explain why. It's because my overriding memory of the Elevation Tour was that getting tickets was a fucking nightmare. They didn't have the capacity in the band's fan club for the demand. They didn't have the capacity full stop. They didn't put on enough shows. They stuck themselves into arenas when there was stadium level demand for the band. Now there wasn't stadium level demand for the band on Pop Mart. So rather than play up to the demand and second guess it now, they decided to deliberately restrict demand. They went into arenas, 10, 20,000 people. And I think apart from one show in the US, Every show sold out, and that's something like a hundred shows. They sold over a million tickets that year. Now, a million tickets that year would be what 12, 13 stadium shows. Um, but they could have easily played stadiums on that tour instead of playing four nights in London at Earl's Court Arena to 80,000 people. They could easily have played two nights at Wembley Stadium to something like 160,000 people, but they chose not to do it. And the, one of the reasons is well, okay, Wembley Stadium was closed, but secondly, was because they wanted to have that cachet of having a hot ticket of people wanting to see you two, of tickets being in demand, of people being able to go, I've got tickets for you too, and you haven't. <laughs> And it wasn't fair and it wasn't right. It really wasn't. You know, the only show on that tour I could get to was in Manchester, which was 150 miles away. And I could only get to one show and I wanted to see about six shows that I couldn't. And, you know, it, it was also the first tour of the Internet era. Um, ticket demands were, were tickets were allocated in, in nonsensical ways. And it really, really annoyed a lot of people. I know a lot of people in the US were able to get a lot of shows for a lot of tickets. But then you two play a lot more shows in the US than they play in the rest of the world stuck together. And, and there were there were plans around the elevation tour to go back into um, stadiums, so they played I think three four outdoor shows, in uh, I think they played two in Berlin, uh, two at Slane Castle and one at Turin, um, but the rest of the tour was indoors and and the the demand vastly exceeded the supply. They could have easily have sold at least twice as many tickets, uh, and Bono was doing the thing where he says, "Well, I'm reapplying for the best band in the world," but. What he really didn't say, and I think what he really meant was he was reapplying for the job of the biggest band in the world. Because they knew that they'd been shunted off by Oasis after they'd spent all that time hanging around with an olive and a giant McDonald's arch dressed as cowboys um, and not really pleasing people. So they had a big hit, um, which also lent itself to the name of the tour, which is Elevation. And there are, I think, five different CD singles and each one of these has a different set of B-sides and some exclusive tracks on. Uh, at this point the CD single was uh, pretty pretty damn um, prolific to be honest and also by the way uh, they were still in the process of doing vinyl so here's the 12 inch of Beautiful Day and Elevation as a double pack. 
Uh, I think this has the David Holmes mix on, which is pretty hard to get otherwise, and the Perfecto mix on of Beautiful Day. Uh, and again, about 4,000 remixes of Elevation. And Elevation is not my favourite U2 single because the lyrics are terrible. And I'll explain why. In rhyming structure in a song, it generally tends to go A, B, A, B, yes, C, D, C, D, C, D. This one, it kind of goes mole, soul, whole, goal. And that's A, 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 A. And that's very it, it, dog shit, very simplistic lyrics. And, and you two are better than that. I was half expecting the next verse to be around told, hold, and a bowl, or something along those lines. Um, and it's just, it's not good enough, really. Um, I've barely touched the Elevation Tour, which I think I'm going to have to see deal with as a, a separate, separate kind of instalment, really. Um, but... What I will say is, and, and this, by the way, is the uh, the unofficial Mexican feature disc version of all that you can't make behind that I started off with right at the beginning. Um, uh, there's no official picture disc. Oh, that was dangerous, wasn't it? There's no official picture disc version of all that you can't leave behind. Um, but all that you can't leave behind, you will have seen a separate episode about this previously, is, as far as I'm concerned, one of U2's worst albums, because it is U2 second-guessing who they are as opposed to being who they are. Uh, I've described it as a peace treaty to a lapsed fan um, recasting U2 as a useful and powerful band. U2 started to compromise with this. You could go anywhere. You could do anything. You could be anyone. And what U2 wanted to be was to wear their heart on their sleeves and be extremely sincere. And, you know, the album is loved by a great many people. And there is no two bones about that. And it is a great album in many, many ways, but it's not a great U2 album. Uh, and that's why I've ranked it 13 out of 15. Side One is pretty good. Kite is phenomenal. Uh, Walk On is a great song, even though it borrows liberally from uh, Eclipse and Brain Damage by Pink, Pink Floyd. Um, Elevation is a great jumpy up and down at a, go a show song, but the lyrics are awful. Stuck in a moment and beautiful day, a fantastic song. Um, but it's not the best U2 album, not by a long way. And I, I really feel that it was, that's why it's my least favourite of the, of the more recent U2 albums. And by the way, at this point, by the way, um, there are more days. So, um, for example, Boy was released in September 1980. All That You Can't Leave Behind was released in, uh, I think, October 2000. So All That You Can't Leave Behind is now nearer in history to the release of Boy than it is to the present day. And that means it's in the first half of U2's career. And that makes me feel pretty damn old. So I'm going to try not to think about it quite like that. But as a, an album, it's got an awful lot to recommend it. But it's not as good as it needs to be. I'm going to quickly wrap up now by saying that the elevation period uh, was also you know, covered with a multitude of bootlegs. Here is uh, one from the Stockholm Globe. Here's one from the Manchester Evening News Arena. That was the show I was at. That was the night where Bonnet told everybody uh, that his dad was just about to die. Here's You 2 Go Home. So this is the soundtrack CD uh, released through the fan club for their show at the Slane Castle. Here's three, I think. Yeah, three CD singles for Walk On. Uh, it's really complicated getting to, to, to follow and try and complete U2's discography at this point. Here's also um, a charity version of what's going on. The London version, which is track three on this, is uh, Chris Martin, Brian Eno and Bono performing the Martin Gay song. Um, and by the time that the band took their tour into uh, the final part of the Elevation tour, they were playing what's going on on almost every show. And here is a, an EP of B-sides called U27 that was released, and I think exclusively via Walmart in 2002. Uh, so I'm going to quickly also wrap up with a multitude of DVDs. There are two official DVDs from the Elevation tour. Here is Elevation Live at Boston, which uh, inexplicably has one removed from it. And here is the uh, the U2 Go Home set. U2 Go Home was not originally planned for release. It was originally broadcast on television around the release of the uh, the best of um, 1990 to 2000, which I mentioned earlier on. Um, but fans were so keen to see it released, it later became a release in Christmas 2003. Um, these are all really... I mean, at this time, though, the shows were fantastic. It was a clear and direct euphoric communication between the band and the audience together to achieve a state of elevation you know to, to reach a state where they came out of the show and they felt that they had an amazing experience 
Um, now, the only other criticism that I think I will make of the album is of the cover. At this point, the band are now treating their lives like they can commute daily to go on planes and places. And again, as I've mentioned, and also as mentioned in New York, the band has started to lose touch with who I think they really were. Um, there's some fantastic imagery from around this period, which I'm sure you will you will come come back to later. Um, but this, I think, this photo from the book by Anton Corbin, You Two and I, this is the shot that I think should have been on the album cover, by the way. I think it's a much better shot. It's strong, it's iconic, and it also ties in with the album's title, All That You Can't Leave Behind. You know, it's a piece of religious imagery there uh, that's uh, outside, I think, a monastery or, or something. Um, but what it's also clearly saying is that's a belief and all that you can't leave behind are your beliefs and your principles and your ethics. Now I'm going to wrap up at that point. I'm not going to talk about the Elevation Tour. The next uh, episode where I talk about U2, I'm going to talk about the best of 90 to 2000. Um, and that will be at some other point when I feel like it. Um, so I'm going to stop here. As usual, don't be a dick in the comments. If the only thing you can say in the comments is it should have been an olive and instead I called it a grape, Keep that to yourself, um, and I will catch up with you some other time. Uh, so, bye gang, see you later.